Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is Monday, April 27th, 2020. Here's a look at the sea surface temperature anomalies for today from the NOAA NESDA site. And you see this updated today. Uh, in the Atlantic Basin, the main development region still quite a bit above the long-term average. And the Caribbean and Gulf are as well. Still a little bit warmer than we are used to seeing in the equatorial Pacific, but I think this is going to change, and we're going to see a pretty dramatic cooling across this area. Over the next several weeks, bottom line, nothing has changed in terms of the thinking that we have a very favorable Atlantic setting up. Uh, we're not going to have a, a favorable pattern in the Pacific, at least one that drives El Nino, and with the absence of El Nino, that by itself is a pretty big indicator that the Atlantic Basin should be more active than average or normal, however you want to look at it. Uh, but it doesn't tell us anything about where the hurricanes are going to go, how bad they're going to be when they get there. And remember, you can just get a tropical storm like Amelda last year. You know, Harvey over Houston was a tropical storm. Allison in 2001 was a tropical storm. Florence... North Carolina, you know, came in here and then kind of milled around for a bit. Category one hurricane. You know, so you don't have to have Dorians and Irmas and Marias to cause significant problems. Those grab the headlines because of their uh, Cat 5 stature. But we need to be concerned with anything that develops. And it just depends on where it is. It is geographically sensitive. Hurricane impacts are. They are geographically sensitive, so keep that in mind. All right, looking at the subsurface, if I can get this to come up. Uh, again, nothing's changed here. Lots of cold water relative to average. Lurking below this surface warm pool, which is gradually eroding away as we revisit this over the coming weeks. You're going to see much more of this colder water. Uh, again, this is colder. It is cold, but it's also colder relative to average. And uh, we're going to see more of it coming to the surface like here. There's a little area over here. And this will just start to expand more and more over the coming weeks. Um, what's more important, though, than anomalies, this is your departures from normal. That's what an anomaly is, plus or minus. Uh, it's anomalous, right? It's an anomaly, whatever. You get the idea. It's all about math. How warm or cold is it relative to average? Well, that's important, but I think this is more important. The upper ocean heat content tells us how much energy is in the upper ocean of our planet. And that is where hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, whatever you want to call them, that's where they derive their energy is from the upper ocean heat content. And this is what we really need to watch. All through here, this will start to expand. You know, it's only April, and we have a ways to go. And that's a little bit ahead of where it should be. It's, it's nothing ridiculous and alarming but remember only a little bit of extra energy in the ocean well that's let me start over a little bit of extra temperature you know a quarter a half three quarters to a full degree a, a degree and a half if we ever saw that yikes but you don't have to raise the ocean temperature that much to gain tremendous amounts of additional energy and that upper upper ocean heat content is what this map shows and we're going to talk about what this scale means over on the right hand side in a future edition of Hurricane U, Hurricane University. It's that public education series that I'm doing and uh, we're going to get somebody in to talk about this um, and we'll understand this a lot better. The differences between anomalies, uh, your surface skin temperatures and upper ocean heat content they are all three related, but they are all different from each other also at the same time, and each of them are important for their own reasons. All right, so here it is, 2020. Just keep your eyes right there. This is 2020. This is a year ago. So here's 2019. So it's not that much different than this year. Maybe there was a little bit more upper ocean heat content to the southeast of the islands down here last year. What about two years ago? Well, I think we can all agree we're ahead of two years ago. And then three years ago, yeah, not that much more ahead. You know, really, uh, in April of 2017, there was 
I think more heat starting to gather in the tropics uh, farther out into the Atlantic than we're seeing this year. But again, there are no really major differences. I guess the only area that you could really argue is right here in the Northwest Caribbean, but it's a small geographic area. That area always has plenty of upper ocean heat content, and it's only April, so we'll see what happens as we go forward, all right? All right, satellite picture of a good chunk of the Western Hemisphere. By the way, the webcam is off today because I just don't feel like looking presentable, so there you go. I <laughs> just wanted to address that. In case you're wondering, hey, where is he? He's usually on in the, a little square. Nope, not today. Um, I look rough, so let's just leave it at that. This is a nice thing to look at, though. This is better than looking at me. A beautiful satellite picture on this late April day. Um, you had some snow up here in parts of the northeast. Okay, it's April. Time to no more snow. All right, please. There's the snow cover in the Rockies, by the way. That's kind of cool. Um, hey, we had some hail and some nasty thunderstorms in southeast North Carolina the other night. Uh, night before last, uh, my kids and I were all up very late. We went out on my front porch and watched it, and uh, the hail was just like a mile north of my location, and uh, I missed out on it. But anyway, that trough that caused all that is heading out, kind of a somewhat of a nor'easter kind of look to it over the North Atlantic. And whatever, this is all well and good. But in the uh, tropics department, there's remnants of TD1E in the eastern Pacific. That came and went very quickly. Again, that too is an outlier or an anomaly in and of itself. Um, you know, there's still some energy down here in the tropics. You can see it down there. It's trying. We're getting closer to the, hey, there's the dog chiming in. I don't know if you hear that, but once in a while, the dog participates. Uh, we're getting closer <laughs> to the uh, start of the East Pacific season officially. TD1E there made it unofficially earlier this year. I guess it's official since the Hurricane Center it, it did advisories on it, but whatever, you get the idea. This, to me, was just interesting. I don't think it means anything. Sometimes records are meant to be broken. You notice down in the Caribbean, just good steady trade winds coming through here. Uh, a few puffy clouds and some light showers that you wouldn't even be able to see on this uh, satellite shot. Passing through portions of the Caribbean and the islands down there. The Caribbean islands. Uh, whatever. I'm just... The dog threw me off my my uh, my groove. Um, no organized disturbances. That's what I'm trying to say. And we can see that in the vorticity signature still... In the North Atlantic, let's use a color that helps us pop everything. How about white? You know, there's your upper, uh, your, what am I trying to say? Your, well, this is the 850 millibar level. So it's about 5,000 feet in the atmosphere. So it's not upper levels, but it's all in the higher latitudes, the energy. That's what I'm trying to say. That's still confined up here in the, uh, you know, the higher latitudes, the subtropics and beyond. Down here in the deep tropics, a little bit more energy. And this is just, to me, one of the tools that I like to use because I can track these little impulses of energy that come across. So there's always a constant flow of it off of South America. And there's a few little areas here in the eastern Pacific. But watch as we go forward. I mentioned this several weeks ago. These will become less and less. We'll see these less and less, and they'll start to increase down here. As the seasons continue to evolve from winter to spring now and then spring eventually into summer and the start of tropical cyclone season in the Western Hemisphere. Anything coming up? Well, if this is a, an analysis of what it looks like, not necessarily right now, this was valid at 1500 UTC, so it's several hours old, but this is the model forecast of the same portion of the atmosphere, the vorticity signature at 850 millibars up. And I use this often during hurricane season. Here is our coastline of the Mid-Atlantic. There's the Capes of North Carolina, South Carolina, there's Florida. That's a terrible Florida. I'm just trying to show you just to get you geographically oriented. <laughs> there's North America, all right? Most of it. Parts of South America too. The uh, Caribbean islands through here, including the Greater Antilles. All right, now that you have that horrible geography lesson. What are we looking for? Well, if we go out in time, 
You see in the upper uh, latitudes, the, the northern latitudes, those little pieces of energy, there's a strong cold front right there and the trough dug out. You can clearly see stuff like that. But do we see anything trying to bundle in circular fashion down here or over here? No. And that's what we're looking for. That is, that's what I look for. That's not necessarily what they look for at the National Hurricane Center. I've never asked. But for me, this is what I look for. This is part of my hunt on a daily basis, especially during hurricane season. Do we see energy trying to bundle? And we're going to go out to about a week. Now there's past a week. You know what? We'll just go out to two weeks just to show an example. So we just go on out to the end of the forecast period of the GFS here, the operational model. And you see, throughout that whole time frame, we back it up, go forward. There's never any major bundling of any energy down in the tropics. Not yet. And that's good because this goes out to about the mid-May. A little bit of energy is trying to stream off of South America. It spills over into the Eastern Pacific, which I always find fascinating. And hopefully you do too. See that? How these little pieces of energy come off the mountains down there of Colombia. Uh, it's neat. It's almost like smoke or flames that come out, especially when you speed it up. And sometimes those close off and uh, kind of attain more vorticity or spin, and you get a, a tropical cyclone out of it. And that usually happens when you get this convectively coupled Kelvin wave that comes across, because you got all this easterly flow coming this way, and the convectively coupled Kelvin wave adds low to mid-level westerly spin or energy, and then you start to kick that westerly wind component in and you spin something up. Oftentimes we'll call that a Central American gyre. You see, it's all coming together and we're just not seeing that yet, which is good. Nobody's complaining, but this is what we will use often uh, this season, even before the season gets started. We'll be taking a look at it. Uh, I mentioned, as I showed you, see this energy rotating up here? Storminess in the mid-latitudes? Well, let's take a look as we segue into severe weather. Still hoping that I will be able to get out to this area right here in May and set up a whole bunch of cameras in front of or inside of a moderate or high risk. Uh, even an enhanced would probably be better because there wouldn't be 10,000 storm chasers out there, hopefully. That's the risky part to all that now. Um, but anyway, in addition to focusing on what I want to do, I want to make sure that you're aware of what's happening. This is today's outlook, as we call it, day one. If we shift ahead to day two, there's the enhanced. Too bad I can't go tomorrow, but I can't. Uh, I'm going to wait until May. Um, categorically, uh, pretty good threat here. Well, you know what I'm saying. It's uh, elevated enough to enhanced, whatever that means. I mean, basically, that's your level three out of five. You know, the whole thing's kind of weird, I guess, but it is what it is. This should get your attention. It's, it's a, there's an enhanced risk there. Well, what is the, how does it break down? Um, some areas are about 5% tornado. That's the brown, 2% in the green. The wind threat is higher at 30%. I think 58 miles, or 50 knots, yeah, so about 58 miles per hour or higher. And then the hail threat, gorilla hail as we call it, Big hailstones, the kind that breaks Reed Timmer's windshields. Uh, that's an Oklahoma problem, it looks like, for tomorrow. So keep that in mind. A lot of people that watch this video, or these videos that I do, they're in um, different phases of disaster recovery, planning, preparedness, etc. They may have uh, companies that go out and do surveys. They do uh, insurance claims, adjusting repair work, and they like to be ahead of the game, so to speak. So that's why I cover lower 48 weather, at least a part of it. As we move out into time, day three, this would be Wednesday. Less of a chance of severe weather, but I think we're going to reload the system down the road. It's not showing up quite yet. And the four, five, six, seven, and eight probability scheme, but it's coming. And I think we're going to have a chance somewhere here in the heart of the alley in May. I mean, I know we will. It's a given. And I hope to be out there and uh, really do something interesting. Not do any chasing, but set everything up just like I do for hurricanes, but do it uh, for a severe weather outbreak, you know, to capture whatever happens, not even necessarily to get a tornado. That's not always the point. we got to stop focusing on these 
Uh, anyway, soapbox time. Let me just get off. We'll deal with it later. All right, so Patreon, I'm going to talk about this more and more. Two reasons. One, this is how I pay my bills right now, so thank you. I appreciate that. Two, it is an incredible way to get information to you guys who are supporting my career. And right now we got 255 of you. And so what I, what am I doing? Well, I'm making posts. You guys always see it first here on Patreon. Some of them I do make public because, again, the bottom line is to serve the public. But i got to be able to earn a paycheck doing so. i uh, got my podcast series on here, which is only available on Patreon. And even at the $1 level, you know, at the very lowest level tier, you get access to the, to the podcast, our original series. Um, anything that I'm posting, it, it goes, look at this. This is neat. A lost tapes kind of deal from Hurricane Ivan, only on Patreon. This is the benefits of supporting uh, my efforts. And so I'm going to do this more and more. Uh, we'll talk about it more. I'm actually going to put together like a video, a two-minute explainer. How are we using Patreon? What can you gain from it? And how do you um, sign up? You know, if you do, what do you get? And I'll go over that soon. It's almost time. Hurricane season's almost here, and we got to get ready. So I'm still trying to figure out who I'm going to have Wednesday for Hurricane University, or Hurricane U as I call it. Um, so stay tuned to my social media. I'm on Twitter right there at hurricane track patreon by the way and i'll put the link in the youtube description but it's everything's hurricane track so twitter.com slash hurricane track facebook.com slash hurricane track you see where i'm going with this youtube patreon i think even instagram it's all the same thing that's my brand hurricane track so that's where i am and i'll be talking about uh as i figure out who i'm gonna have wednesday and what the topic will be you know, even though people are working from home, they're still busy. And not everybody's waiting around for Mark to email them and ask to be on the broadcast. So I'm trying to figure out who's available and what we're going to talk about. So stay tuned for that. All right? And hey, listen, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, I know it's been a rough 12 weeks for the world. And, you know, certainly in the United States where, unfortunately, we're number one in leading the way in COVID-19 problems, apparently. And I recognize that. I'm not ignoring that fact. And that being said, you know, we're going to have to face this hurricane season. And I'm going to approach it from a very positive standpoint in that we have experience with hurricanes. This generation, and, and unless you're 100 plus years old, you got no experience with pandemics. So let's use our experience with hurricanes to our advantage and show the world we've been there before. You know, we have. Show us you've been here before, and I'm going to help you do that. And so that leads me to my exit. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll see you on Wednesday for something of note on Hurricane U, and then next week for the off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. And I think that's the last one that will be officially the off-season, and then we might as well just call it the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. All right, have a great rest of your week. I'll speak to you again soon.